Morning, everybody. Look, my face is back. Yeah, right there, that sneeze. I'm trying to decide if it's allergies or not now. <laughs> but I am feeling a little bit better. Um, spring break is almost upon us. Right. Almost there. Almost there. I hope you have a good spring break. I hope you don't lose too much momentum. That's typically what happens. But uh, we'll pick up the pieces on the other side. What I wanted to do today is uh, finish up chapter 10, do a couple more examples of chapter 10, and then uh, move into chapter 16, which in my opinion is the natural next place that you should go. Once you study a bunch about wiggling things up and down, it's natural to go into waves. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. I believe I had set the homework for chapter 10 to be due this Friday. I fixed that. It's due Saturday. I think I originally set it for Friday because I, you know, the sanctity of spring break or whatever. And then people were remarking, hey, Mr. Bailey, why isn't it Saturday? I'm like, fine, it's Saturday. Okay. Um, so it, I moved it back to Saturday. All right. I uh, wanted to do an example of conservation of energy uh, with simple harmonic motion. And um, we'll use the example. So let's. Um, Nobody likes clowns, right? Clown, clowns are out now, right? So let's launch a clown from a cannon. I don't know if you've ever seen that where the human cannonball gets launched out of the cannon, right? So we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a cannon, don't do this at home, okay? But we're gonna do a cannon aimed straight up, okay? And we're gonna launch a clown out of it, okay? And the clown's gonna go up, and reach some maximum height. And we're gonna measure that maximum height from the top of the cannon, right? So so we want that H right there. How high will the how high will the clown go, right? If we load them onto a spring with spring constant K, we push the spring down a distance X. It doesn't matter if it's y or x, it's just some distance, right? And um, we know the, the mass of the clown. I'm not going to give you any numbers in this one, we're just going to use symbols for everything. Uh, sorry, this is just for the sake of my own note-keeping. So we're jumping around a bit. What chapters should I be writing? We're still in chapter, what is this, 10? 10, 10 right? right cool. So, yeah. Now, initial and final points. Right, we, we got to set up those three things, right? Initial, final, and where the zeros are. So initially, go ahead and stick with down here at the bottom, because that's where the clown's starting. We know plenty of information about that point. And we'll go final position up at max height, since the problem is asking me to find how high above the cannon, right, um, this clown makes it. And then zero. Well, what was my rule of thumb for gravitational potential energy? Mr. Bailey doing the problem, where did I always put zero? Not the middle, at the, at the lowest point possible, right? Just that way so I could always make sure that like my heights and things weren't going negative on me or whatever. So I am gonna continue with that practice, right, of putting the zero for gravity as low in the point of the problem as I can. But now, with spring potential energy, we have another zero. But this zero we don't have control over. Where is zero for a spring? At the equilibrium. That means the relaxed position of the spring. In other words, if this clown were not loaded into this slot, into this cannon, right, where would the spring be? Well, it would be up at the top of the cannon. Like it's, it's natural resting position. You're, you're usually told, right, like that the spring is compressed a certain distance. Well, the implication is that it's resting length, right, it started at rest and was compressed all of that distance. So, the zero for my spring is going to be in a different place, and that's okay. It's okay to have different zeros for spring potential energy 
versus gravitational potential energy. They can even be the same if you want them to be, but I feel more comfortable doing it this way. All right, so we start off, right, with conservation of energy. In this problem, we don't have any sources of energy loss, like there's no friction, uh, no air friction, no friction in the cannon that we're told about. We're just told spring constant distance, amount of compression, and the mass there. So that's a that's a nice big zero. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna be very clear here. I'm gonna try and spell out all the different kinds of energy that I can have in in the problem. Not just this problem, but any energy problem. So the final energy, right? That could be regular kinetic energy, the kind of kinetic energy something has when it's moving. But now we also know that it could have rotational kinetic energy. This thing could be rotating. And it also could have gravitational potential energy as well as spring potential energy. So, so worst case scenario, there's four things, right? that could possibly be going on. Hopefully they're not all doing that. And then I have exactly the same considerations to make on the initial side, right? I could have kinetic energy initial. I could have initial rotational energy. I could have gravity, gravitational potential energy. And now I could have spring potential energy. So these are all things to consider and ask questions about at each of these points. Again, don't get tied up into what's going on in the middle. It doesn't matter. This equation only cares about initial point and final point. It's able to handle everything else. So let's go to the final point. That's where we start. Final minus initial, right? So at the final point up there at max height, is the clown moving? No, right? Comes to zero, max height? Nice, right? So we can go ahead and say that zero because it's not moving, right? Is the clown rotating up there? Are we given any information about how fast the clown is rotating up there? No, so we'll assume that the omega is also zero up there. Okay, does the clown have any gravitational potential energy? Another way to ask that question is, is there a zero up there? There's no zero up there, right? So we need to figure out what the gravitational potential energy is. We know it's equal to mgh, but we gotta figure out. So we'll just, we'll leave that alone for now and we'll get back to it. All right, spring potential energy. Is there any spring up at the final point? No. So it turns out in, for this particular problem, all I have up there is gravitational potential energy. All right, and now we do the same set of questions, but down at the initial point. When the clown is initially launched, what's the initial speed of the clown? Zero, right? In that moment when the spring is let go, the clown is not moving, but they are going to be moving <laughs> very shortly. Is the clown rotating down there? No. So again, V is zero, omega is zero down there. Uh, gravitational potential energy, are we at a zero point? Yes, we are for gravity. So we'll go ahead and wipe that one out. Now, at the initial point, is a spring compressed or stretched? Yeah, right, it's been compressed there, right? So I can't, I can't knock that one out. Okay, so now I come back through and I write down mathematical statements uh, that are behind these concepts, right? Potential energy, gravity. Well, I know that that's gonna be m times g times a height above my zero point. But in this problem, it's not just h, is it? What's the total height above my zero? It's h plus x, isn't it? I've got not just the height above the opening of the cannon, but I also have the compression of the string. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I include, right, that total distance from where I said zero was up to where the clown ends up. All right, minus, and now I only have the spring potential energy, which is one half times the spring constant times the amount that the spring is compressed, which in this problem 
is x, and I've got to remember to square that, right? It's 1 half kx squared. Um, the problem is asking for h, so at this point, what do we do? We do math, right? The physics is over for the time being, right? And this is now a math problem. So to do this math problem, I'll multiply through my mg's just to get h into a single term like that. Um, I'll move the 1 half kx squared and the mgx over to the other side. mgx equals mgh. Uh, let's see. I can't cancel the mass, right? Why can't I cancel the mass? It's not in every term everywhere, right? But if I want h all by itself, I do have to divide by mg, and I got to do the same thing on both sides of the equation, right? So my h is going to end up being kx squared over 2mg minus x, uh, if I did all my algebra right there. All right, so that's a symbolic result for this problem. Uh, if I had the numbers, I could go ahead and throw them in there and get a number. In your homework, I believe I gave you a problem where they're launching like a, a ball out of a toy gun or something like that. There's a spring in it. Um, they do set their height from where the ball launches. So just be careful, right? You can follow this pattern up to a point, okay, for that homework problem. Basically, you can follow the pattern of thinking about energy and all that. You'll want to set it all up. And you can follow the pattern through, but, but don't rely on this box answer here, right? This isn't a generic result. This is more of a very specific result for this problem. So it's process that you want to be looking at, process that you want to duplicate. That equation right there is not going to help you with that particular homework problem. Again, because they, they define their H slightly differently. And um, in the problem, are they asking you to solve for spring constant? I don't remember. Whatever it is, right? So trying to teach you a process and an approach rather than specific results for the problem. All right. So let's talk real quickly, two more like topics that need to come out uh, before we finish off with chapter 10. And that's how simple harmonic motion helps us with other systems, well, that don't look like springs, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but this doesn't really look like a spring, does it? I mean, there's no, there's no up and down, like where's the spring constant here, right? <laughs> Well, it does look an awful lot like a spring from a physicist's point of view. Because as far as physicists are concerned, this ball is doing exactly the same thing that the mass on the end of a spring would do. It's repeating its motion over and over and over again, right? It gets to a spot, and then it goes, and comes back, and then it repeats exactly that motion over and over and over again. So a pendulum, any object on the end of a string, okay, is going to exhibit simple harmonic motion. And like any simple harmonic oscillator, the key to unlocking its mysteries, its potential, is figuring out what omega is. Well, <laughs> the omega for, and I won't, I'm not going to overwhelm you or bore you or make it look like I'm smarter than you by deriving a whole bunch of things. I don't want to do any of that. I'll just let you know that when you apply what we know about simple harmonic oscillators and we try to find the very air quotes springiness that exists in this system, we end up with an omega, a key that is equal to little square root of little g over the length of the pendulum. The length of the pendulum is always the length of the, and so we, it goes from where it articulates to the center of mass at the end. We did this way back in the second lab of this semester. And that lab more or less was an excuse to learn how to use the computers, 
but we were using pendulums. And the equation that we gave you in that lab for the period of a pendulum was equal to the 2 pi times the square root of the length of that pendulum divided by little g. And then we use that equation to find out what little g is, right? And pretended like we were finding something that nobody knew. So how do we get from the key, omega, to this period equation? Well, do you remember that omega, oops, the period, sorry, omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, and the frequency was equal to 2 pi over the period for any simple harmonic oscillator? Well, if we solve this for t, we get 2 pi over omega, and then when we put in omega, which is the square root of g over l, and you have a fraction in the denominator, it flips over, doesn't it? And that's what gets us up to here. I believe your book, your book writes this, I think, as 2 pi f equals uh, the square root, oh, I wrote it down, what your book does. Yeah, uh, g over l. Right, so, so what they're doing there is they're trying not to talk about omega, even though omega is the key to everything, right? Uh, <clears throat> the thing I've got in the box and the one just to the right of it are exactly the same equation. They're just, they're just written, you know, one's in terms of the period time and the other's in terms of the angular frequency omega. Why would knowing the period of a pendulum be important? Well, it seems like it's not too important anymore, especially now that all of our clocks are based not on the physical motion of a clock's pendulum, but if it's a mechanical clock, it's probably got springs in it, okay? Again, springs and pendulums totally related to each other. But even moving away from mechanical systems into digital systems, the way that computers and our phones and everything keep time used to be based on crystals, uh, quartz crystals. And the quartz would vibrate under an electrical signal and they would count those vibrations. But that would mean that computers and other things would vary in their timekeeping by almost a second per day. A quartz oscillator it isn't all that stable. And so new systems were invented in order to keep time. And among them were atomic clocks. What atomic clocks do, surprise, surprise, is measure the oscillations of atoms. There's a particular atom of cesium that undergoes trillions of oscillations per second. And in making machines that can count each one of those oscillations, we define a second based on the oscillations of those atoms. So we're very much still tied into wiggles. Your phone is keeping time by using atomic clocks. And there's not an atomic clock in your phone, but if your phone is connected to the internet, it's receiving a time signal. Not just the internet, actually any cell tower. And all those towers are synchronized to atomic time, and that atomic time is maintained both in Colorado uh, and in Virginia. There's two national labs that are responsible for keeping the time signal, not just for the United States, but actually they're interconnected all over the world. Bringing it back to home, I and mean, time's important, right? And I, I've, I used to be, maybe I'm just old and cranky now, but I used to be more uh, forgiving of people being late and all that kind of stuff to meetings because everybody's clocks were always just a little bit different. Nobody has that excuse anymore, right? Like literally everybody's clocks are synchronized now. It used to be that you had to, if you really wanted to be at the same place at the same time as somebody else, you had to synchronize your watch to that other person's. It didn't matter if both were telling the right time, it just mattered that both were telling the same time. Well now that synchronization no longer necessary because it's done automatically for us. Um, but bringing it a little bit closer to home, this equation for the period of a pendulum is based on a simple pendulum, and it requires a small angle, that, that 15 degrees we messed around with in that lab. But um, a lot of pendulums that exist nowadays, at least the important ones that affect us on a daily basis, 
aren't masses on the end of strings. Their rods articulating through a joint. In fact, a double joint, okay? Because legs are actually two pendulums attached to each other. And the motion of those pendulums affect the quality of life, physiology of the organism, okay? And there's something called gait, and uh, this word is spelled for G-A-I-T, okay? So not like a garden gate opening a fence. But the word gait refers to a person's natural walking rhythm, and that walking rhythm is set by the length of their leg, how much their knee bends, and the period, right, as, as a person walks, it's the period, right, of the swing of their leg. So there's lots of things that can affect the natural period, the natural frequency that a person's built-in pendulums, right, will swing. And in a simple form, a physical, a physical pendulum, which is not a pendulum on the end of the string. So it's more like a, it's like a bar, maybe with a mass on the end. We'll just do a simple one here. So this wouldn't be like your leg because your leg is a double pendulum. But a system that is swinging back and forth like this, the mass is not centered right down at the end like a simple pendulum. There's mass spread throughout. But we know how to deal with that because we can find like center of mass of the system. Uh, we can find the moment of inertia of like a rod and a mass at the end. All kinds of things we can do here. You're not necessarily going to use this equation. I just want to point something out. The equation for a, a simple physical pendulum looks a little bit like this. And you can see there that there's moments of inertia in there. And then that L isn't the length of the pendulum, it's the distance to the center of mass. Don't get into the weeds here. Don't worry about the equation so much. What I'm trying to point out okay, is that people have a natural frequency and period with which they walk called their gait. And if anything happens to their limb, that gait can be thrown off. Growing up, I had a friend who had a prosthetic leg. He didn't have a leg from the knee down, okay? And um, he would get made fun of in school and all that kind of stuff, because he walked funny. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody that's had a prosthetic limb, okay? Uh, but sort of that classic pirate with the wooden leg kind of thing, right? How, how, does, how does that kind of person walk if their prosthetic isn't very good? Yeah, it's like, it's like an uneven thing, right? There's like, a, there's like a natural period on one side, and then there's like a kind of a wrong frequency or a wrong period on the other side, okay? And I'm, I'm really kind of overselling how much somebody with a prosthetic nowadays would walk, right? But you may have seen, right, that kind, and that's the gait, right? That person's gait isn't even on either side of their body. Well, I remember one day in high school, my friend showed up and was like, Walking normal, right? Across the quad. And we ran over, like, ha, ha, ha. what's going on here, right? And he pulled up his pants and he had had a new prosthetic limb fit. That because he had more or less stopped growing, the the instead of sort of like a one size fits all for the growing kid, right, kind of thing, he now had one that was fitted for his particular physiology, for his gait. And as I grew into physics and started understanding more about biophysics and all that kind of stuff, what I discovered was is that um, prosthetists, doctors who are responsible for making prosthetic limbs, use the engineering and the knowledge we have about how oscillating systems work to be able to tune these prosthetics to the natural gait of the person as if it was exactly like the other limb, so that people can now walk, and if they're wearing pants, there's no way that you can tell. And not just walk, but like run. Like they can tune these prosthetics now so that people, amputees, can compete in the Olympics 
not in the Paralympics. They can actually compete in the regular Olympic events because the science has gotten to the point where they can tune the prosthetics to match what the athlete would be capable of naturally so that the competition in playing field is exactly the same. It's, 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 like, it's, like, my, it's like me living in Star Trek, right? It is so cool. There was a, th this is a story that's maybe a little bit beyond the um, every day, uh, but in the Boston Marathon bombings that took place, uh, hundreds of people uh, lost parts of their legs uh, in that horrific event. One of those people um, was a ballerina for the, the Boston Ballet. And she lost her, her foot basically kind of from the lower shin down. So she lost her ankle, lost her foot. Um, and was told by her doctors that she would never be able to dance ballet the way that she had previously. Apparently, this person's plight was noticed by the engineering students at MIT. And the engineering department and the students decided that that wasn't a good enough answer. And so they developed a prosthetic ankle for this woman, prosthetic foot and ankle, uh, that was powered and motorized with electronics and all kinds of mini motors and a bunch of MIT stuff. Uh, and two years after her accident, uh, was able to dance in the ballet again. On point, exactly the way that she did before. And that technology, though, a prototype for her, is now making its way into um, the prosthetics for the quote-unquote normal everyday people that don't have access to the MIT engineering department, right? Um, so it, it, it's, it's just amazing what we are able to do when we understand what's going on. Was she able to like physically control the ankle? Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was impressive. Just Not just an engineering marvel, but a bioengineering Did they use like, did they find a way to like hook up like nerve endings? It was, it, so nerve endings die pretty quickly and they're hard to regenerate, although we're getting a little bit better at that. Um, what they were able to do is they were able to take muscle contractions that were going on in her upper leg and translate that and then use machine learning to figure out it, it, was, it, was, it was really cool. It's, we live in Star Trek. Like, it is just, it's so cool. It is so cool. It's so cool. Anyway, um, I digress. There's a reason behind the things that we teach you. We're not just trying to torture you with math. And you're just at the tip of this iceberg, right? These equations we're showing you are the basic, simple, simple thing that when you finally get down into it, I mean, humanity can pull off some just truly, truly amazing things. All right, let's, uh, let's quickly talk about what happens when you don't have a simple harmonic oscillator. When you have a system that is being forced to oscillate at a frequency. So, so up to this point, we've always just, we've set the system in motion, okay? And it's just swung back and forth. And what I'm talking about now is taking this system and adding a periodic input of energy, right? That's what a forced oscillator is. This is kind of like the opposite of friction. It's, it's putting energy into the system. And you are familiar with forced oscillators. Matter of fact, you're very familiar with forced oscillators if you've ever gone to the park and swung on the swings. I love watching kids learning how to swing on the swings, right? Because they, what do kids do when they sit down on the swing and they're trying to learn how to, how to swing? Right? They're just kind of doing this random, like, yeah, right? They get all frustrated and they cry and you like look at them and it's like, well, at least it's not death and taxes, right? Okay? My kids always have existential dread growing up. Um, why isn't that random motion working. What do you need in order to increase the amplitude of your swing? Well, you need to kind of get started, right? So you kind of kick off the ground to get the swing going, but then 
when do you pump on the swings? Like, at what point in the motion are you adding energy to the system by pulling on the chains and swinging your legs? When it's picking up speed. Kind of like when you're coming back, right? And so the other way to think about this is if you're pushing a kid on the swings, right? You stand back, you push the kid, they swing out, right? And they're coming back, and you wait for their momentum to sort of shift back to the other way, and then you add the energy, right? It's not like you add energy and then run over here and add energy, right? So next time you have an opportunity to swing on the swing, go to the swings. Get swinging, right? Normal, regular swinging. And then I challenge you to start pumping, pulling, and swinging your legs at, at random times. Like, like try, you know, you know to do it here, but try it down at the very bottom. Try it when you're at the top. Don't fall out of the swing, right? You'll find that your amplitude will die. Like, you'll, you'll, your swing will not be as big if you're pumping at random times. That's because you're trying to add energy into the system when it doesn't want energy. You're fighting against the system's amplitude. The phenomenon where the amplitude of an oscillation gets bigger and bigger and bigger, when you add energy at the frequency it wants it, is called resonance. So resonance is this idea phenomenon of increasing the amplitude of an oscillator by forcing it or wiggling it at its natural frequency. And I'm not giving you any equations here. We're just doing concept here, right? And so I went and I, I said, okay, internet, I need pictures of people on swings, kids on swings, right? And so of course, um, the internet just started giving me white people. But, uh, I mean, you can't deny the happiness that is there, right? This, that is a good time right there, isn't it? Okay? And so I was like, okay, more pictures, right? So more white people. Um, but, yeah, I mean, come on. Swings are just fun, aren't they? And then I saw this one, and I was like, oh, oh, that is happy. I mean, can't you tell how happy that dog is? I can't. Anyway. Um, and then I found this video. This dad, oh my gosh, this dad has dad points. Look at the master of forced, forced oscillation and resonance here. Right? I mean, look at that. Just keeping up. That natural frequency, the two different frequencies, and that other kid looks like he's going to fall out. <laughs> I can never tell what that kid's saying. It's joy. Is it? I mean, it's either that or stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. I don't know. What didn't sound like crying, right? But did you see how he was like, he had the one frequency going on over here, and then he had that other frequency going on? I mean, that, that's... It's a far cry from what I usually see at the park, which is a bunch of parents staring at their cell phones while they push their kid. Okay, so resonance in systems is really, really important because resonance is this increase in amplitude. But if things are wiggling far more than they're designed to wiggle, there can be problems. So I want to give, I want to show you some footage from a bridge collapse. Spoiler alert. That took place in the late 1940s. Perhaps, among other things, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was the most spectacular Aeolian harp in history. Unfortunately, its first performance was destined to run only about four months. In the meantime, she was a beautiful bridge. Beautiful but a little strange. Even before construction was completed, people observed its peculiar behavior. That was because, even in a light breeze, ripples ran along the bridge. After a while, one of the local humorists called her Galloping Gertie. And for fairly obvious reasons, the name stuck, at least until the 7th of November, 1940. 
Then as now, Seattle and Tacoma were sports-minded cities. For four months, a regional sport was to drive across the bridge on a windy day. While some claimed it was like riding a roller coaster, others found it a little disconcerting to see the car in front disappear. How popular this bridge sport was, or to what extent it might have spread across the country, is anybody's guess. On November 7, 1940, the winds were relatively moderate, about 40 miles per hour. A new mode appeared. Rather than ripple, the bridge began to twist. A wind of 40 miles per hour is not too strong, but it was strong enough to start the bridge twisting violently. And at 11 a.m., it fell. Investigators were mystified. A bridge constructed according to the best engineering standards of the day, perhaps the best bridge in the world, this was not a bridge that was supposed to collapse. What in the world? I'm in smoke. I said late 1940s, early 1940. So <clears throat> let me just start by saying this uh, if I don't, all the engineers in the world will get mad at me. This wasn't caused just by resonance, even though I'm going to explain it as an example of resonance phenomenon. So there, there's a lot of very complicated things that are going on here, but I'm going to simplify it down. So this is a slight lie, just I'm letting you know I'm lying by omission here. I'm not telling you the whole story. So did you catch the wind speed on the day that it collapsed? Moderate. It was moderate. They said moderate. It was 40 miles an hour or such. This was a bridge that was designed to withstand hurricane force winds of 75 to, to 90 miles an hour. Like the Tacoma Narrows, which is up in Washington State, okay? It's this narrow a place where two pieces of land, okay, come close together and the, the air gets sort of funneled between the two islands and, and it, it just it, it moves faster as it goes through the narrows. And so they knew, right, that the bridge had to withstand these really high winds. And so they designed the bridge to do that. You saw the flexibility of the bridge, right? It was designed to flex and to move like that and to be okay and safe in that configuration. But at that four, magic 40 mile an hour wind, they had that new resonance mode appear where we had that, it was a, it's called a torsional resonance or torsional wave going along the axis of the bridge. And what we were seeing was a 15-foot amplitude. Like, the, uh, the sides of the bridge were going through 30 feet of displacement up and down, right? And it was not, it was a surprise. It was a total surprise to the designers and engineers of that bridge. Ever since the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse, buildings and bridges have been tested not just for their strength, but also tested for their aerodynamics. In other words, they put them in wind tunnels and simulations to make sure that there isn't a associated unknown resonance that can take place. That bridge was being exposed to a wind speed that it should have been able to handle in every sense. It's just they didn't realize that they had to check for resonance phenomenon. The bridge was being pushed by that wind speed at exactly the right amount to get it to start wiggling. And with every little push, that wiggle got bigger and bigger and bigger until you had failure of the entire system. There was an early commercial jet, oh, maybe I shouldn't use this example now that Boeing was having so many problems. <laughs> um, but back in the, the late 1940s, early 1950s, there was a, um, a plane that was being developed for commercial flight. Uh, it had propellers on it, twin, twin engine propellers. And uh, I think it was four or five test pilots lost their lives testing this new airplane. It would fly up, everything would be fine, and then the plane would simply disintegrate in the sky. Like, like they couldn't, like, it, it was a total mystery. 
And so they went back to the drawing board, tried to redesign stuff. On this next test flight, the, um, the pilot in charge, pilot in command, noticed that when the, when the plane was set to its cruise throttle, so the, the amount of engine power to maintain a nice steady speed at altitude, as soon as they stuck it into that position, there would be this vibration that would exist throughout the entire like cockpit. The cockpit was just vibrating. And so not knowing where that vibration was coming from, they would throttle down and the vibration would go away. They go full throttle, no vibration. It was just a cruise that this vibration would start to set up. And so as they were going through their testing and trying to figure out what's going on, the pilot put it into cruise throttle, the vibration started and decided to look out the window back at the wings. And what the wings on this airplane were doing was this. Okay, this is not how airplanes work. Okay, birds do that, right? Human-made airplanes do not flap their wings. It turns out, but it immediately throttled back and the wings went back to straight. It turns out that the propeller, their frequency, their angular frequency, had matched the resonant frequency for the wings. And the amplitude of oscillation was building up. And what they suspect happened in the other test flights is that the plane literally had resonated itself apart. Tore the wings off, okay? And, and when planes don't have their wings, they only fly for a little bit more. So resonance as a phenomenon is pretty important to understand uh, when you're designing things. You don't want your buildings having a resonant frequency equal to the frequency of an earthquake wave, right? Because if the earthquake comes by and your building starts to resonate with it, your building's going to collapse and fall down. So now they design buildings with dampeners and all kinds of friction in them to prevent that from happening. Um, so nuclear resonance kind of increases amplitude. Uh, where it's not exactly at the right point. Yeah, it just, kind of like yeah, it just dies. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so that sets us, tees us up nicely for moving into waves and sound. Okay, your book decides to go into thermodynamics for a little while, which I never understand. Um, but we're going to jump right over chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. We'll come back. That'll be your last unit. We'll, we'll cycle back to that. Um, but now we need to talk about uh, pushing and extending this concept and idea of simple harmonic motion into a wave. And I want to pull up a applet that's going to help us. Uh, I got to set it up one second. None. Go tension right there. Oh, and okay. So I've got that set up and I'll show you what that is here in a second. But before I do, let's, let me ask you, right? What's a wave? Like some amount of energy increasing, decreasing, and so there is an oscillation. Okay, sine and cosine functions look wavy, don't they? Right? Um, defining a wave can be a little bit difficult, but it's not like mass. We actually have a definition for what a wave is. I'll give it to you in a second. Okay? But maybe it's easier for you to tell me examples of waves. Like what kinds of waves are out there? Ocean. Ocean waves. This usually is not the first guess by people who are from the Central Valley, right? Usually I hear like sound waves, light waves, winds or something. And then finally we get to the ocean, right? Okay. But ocean waves very definitely are kind of wave. It's actually a kind of wave we're not going to talk about <laughs> because it's a surface wave. It's a wave that's existing between two media, air and water, that are coming together. It's actually really, really cool. And um, I'm told fun to surf on, but... I was never one for surfing. Um, I was always one for snorkeling and scuba diving. And so all my friends that did surf, I did grow up in Santa Cruz, and yes, I'm not a surfer. I know, it's kind of like I committed some sort of heinous act. But um, I would go out and snorkel while my friends were surfing, and then I would snorkel underneath where they were sitting on their boards and grab them from below so that they thought they were being eaten by sharks. It was always very fun um, for me. 
I believe uh, sometimes energy waves can be used to transmit information. Yep. Through, uh, Absolutely. So Wi-Fi <laughs> is using electromagnetic waves to send information wirelessly. So those are all examples of waves, but what is a wave? So it can be difficult to show you something that um, for all intents and purposes is mostly invisible, <laughs> like the wind and all that kind of stuff. So I want to show you a simulation, okay? And what this simulation has done is it's, um, one second, got a mirror. Um, what it's done is it's mathematically modeling, okay? what a wave is doing, okay? So as you can see here, we've got like a string, okay? It's made up of these red and green balls. And then we have over here on the end, the thing that's generating the wave is an oscillator. Now, I'm gonna slow this down a little bit. I'm gonna go slow motion, okay? And the nice thing about the simulation, right, is that I can kind of control it, right? I can slow it down, I can pause it and talk about things, right? But as you can see here, right, we've got this rotating thing that's causing this bar to go up and down, right? And what kind of motion is that bar doing? R repeated motion. Simple harmonic oscillation, the, the motion that we just studied, right? So there's going to be frequency there, there's going to be period, there's going to be an omega, there's amplitude, all that kind of stuff. But because it's connected, right, to this string, right, it is sending information about that wiggle along the x-axis in the direction of wave travel. Take a look at, let's see, there's my... Yeah, okay. So take a look at this green dot right here, okay? Just isolate your gaze to that green dot. What is it doing? Up and down how? It's an oscillator, isn't it? It's a simple harmonic oscillator. In fact, if you, if you look at it, it takes just about the same amount of time to go up and down as this original one did, right? Okay, so the periods are the same. But is it doing the same thing at the same time? No, it's not, right? It's like it's, it's offset a little bit. It's, it's, oh, there was this one over here. So it's up and, well, that one was up. Let's do this one. This one's down while that one's up, right? Okay. And if we, don't, if we stop looking at the green ones, if we look at the red ones, if you, if you just kind of look at like these three that are together right here, you can see that they're slightly off from each other, right? Now, they all have the same frequency. They all have the same period. It's just they're not getting to amplitude at exactly the same time, right? They're not getting to equilibrium at exactly the same time. So very sterile, very scientific definition for a wave is that it is a collection of simple harmonic oscillators. <laughs> What we have here isn't just one thing wiggling up and down. We have a collection of connected things that are wiggling up and down. And we call that collection, we call this phenomenon, we call it a wave. This wave has amplitude. Do you see this dotted line right here that is the equilibrium position of all those oscillators? So what do you think the wave's amplitude is? Like graphically, where would you draw it? from that equilibrium up to the top. And there's a name, there's a name for that top of a wave. Does anybody know what it is? is it crest? crest is a good name. We use another word when we talk about like the top of a mountain, a peak, right, okay? So the peak or crest of a wave is this thing that's up here, right? And it's just another one comes along, right, okay? Now, um, I think it was Aiden just said, well, what about the down part, right? Is, isn't this distance the same as that distance right there? The answer is yes. So just like in the simple harmonic oscillator, same amplitude above is below, right? Only, what do we call this downy part? What did you say? Trough. I am not responsible for the English spelling of this word. We 
Because as far as I'm concerned, that's pronounced true. <laughs> right? Okay. Right? <laughs> right? This is not how you should spell that word. Trough should be spelled like, I don't know, like that. Right? English is just a weird language. It's, it's, it's just dumb. Okay? Um, but it's here to stay for whatever. Well, I know the reason. It has to do with the British. But you could say, I mean, we had a perfect thing going, right? We talked about the peak of a mountain. What's the opposite of a mountain called? A valley. <laughs> like, why did we screw this? How did we screw this up so badly, right? Okay. So you'll hear mention of peaks and troughs. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's the bendy down part. Um, I prefer peak and valley, but I, apparently I'm outnumbered by just about every physicist in the world. I'm sorry, I, just, I keep perpetuating the horribleness that is the word trough. Anyway, so it's got peaks, it's got troughs, it has amplitude, it has frequency, it has period. Don't worry, we're going to write all this down in the toolbox here in a second. But new... New to our, so, so we know about simple harmonic oscillator, right? New to our simple harmonic oscillator collection now is that this peak right here is moving across the screen with a certain speed, isn't it? And if we measured how far this thing went in a certain amount of time, we would have a velocity. And notice, the speed of this peak and the speed of this peak are exactly the same. The speed of that trough and that trough are exactly the same. The speed of that peak and that trough are all the same. So this wave does indeed have a speed. All right. Amplitude, speed, frequency, period. All right. Watch what happens when I change the frequency of this wave. I'm going to increase the frequency, and we need to give it a little bit of time to kind of sort itself out here, okay? But do you notice how we have more peaks now, and the peaks are closer together? Frequency, one way to think about frequency when it comes to waves is if you're standing, say, right here, you count how many peaks pass by you, in a certain amount of time, say one second, okay? Period would be how long it is between two successive peaks, or troughs if you prefer. But, and it's kind of hard to tell because your brain wants to be fooled a little bit, the individual oscillators are moving up and down faster, but is that peak moving any faster than it was before? Let me... Throw this back down to one and a half-ish, right? But look at how fast that's going compared to how fast that's going. They're going the same speed. And if I lower the frequency, ooh, ooh, now, ooh, golly. Look at how fast that peak is going across the screen. I know it feels slower, and maybe you just have to believe me, but in fact, it's moving at exactly the same speed. The speed, I'm going to say this a lot, and it's really important, not just for 2A, but also for 2B. The speed of a wave depends only on one thing, and that one thing is the medium, the material in which the wave is traveling. The speed of a wave is set by the material we also call it the medium in which the wave is traveling. That means a sound wave in air has a different speed than a sound wave in water. Why? The medium is different. The material the wave is traveling through is different. All right. Why that's important will become obvious in a little bit. Um, but what I want to do right now get this thing back to its original-ish frequency right there, okay? Let's go and clean that up a bit, okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna freeze frame. Let's see, I'll do it over here first. So we'll uh, freeze frame right there, okay.
The advantage of the simulation is that I can pause it, right? Real waves just continue on traveling and it can be hard to, to, to visualize them. But we tend to visualize waves when we draw them as sine and cosine functions, right? Just, just draw some wiggles. So we talked about amplitude. So just visually, amplitude would be measured from equilibrium to either a peak or a trough, okay? Um, frequency and period, again, hard to sort of visualize on these things. But there's a, new, there's a new measurement that we can use when it comes to waves, and it's called the wavelength, defined as the distance between two peaks or two troughs. The wavelength has units of meters, of length. It's a length. It's a distance between two successive peaks or troughs. That symbol that you're seeing right there is the Greek letter lambda. Um, the way that you draw lambda is um, you draw a candy cane, only this candy cane is in the act of falling over, right? It, 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 it was standing up straight, and now it's falling over, and so it sticks out its leg to support itself, okay? It's a Greek letter, it's part of the Greek alphabet, and it's the symbol we use to denote wave length. Okay. It's a distance. If you take a wave length, which has units of what? Meters. And you multiply it by a frequency, which has units of what? A hertz, which is another name for an inverse second. So one over a second. What's a meter times a one over a second? It's a meter per second, which is also a velocity, isn't it? This equation is used a lot, okay? It's a fundamental relationship that links wavelength frequency and wave speed. But be very careful. This equation is a trap. It's a trap. Because it would lead you to believe that the speed of a wave depends on the wavelength of the frequency. Now, can you find the speed of a wave if you know the wavelength of the frequency? Yes, you can. But what is going to change the speed of a wave? the material, the medium in which the wave is traveling. Wavelength and frequency don't have anything to do with medium. So this relationship right here is really a relationship between frequency and wavelength. The speed is usually a constant here, unless you change the material, which we really don't do until we get to, to B, okay? This speed will be set. What changes is wavelength and frequency. For example, if I make the frequency bigger, I make the frequency number go up, what does lambda have to do to keep the speed the same? It's got to go down. So what this equation tells us is frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. So this wave has a certain frequency, the number of times a peak goes by okay, in one second, and a certain wavelength. If I make the frequency bigger, notice what happens to the wavelength. What happened to the distance between the peaks? It got smaller. Frequency and wavelength are inverses of each other. If you make wavelength bigger, meaning you make the distance between peaks get bigger, the frequency is going to go down. The equation V equals lambda F is a lot of utility, and we'll use, like I said, it, it, it crops up all the time, okay? But um, don't fall into a trap thinking that speed changes because frequency changes. It doesn't. What will change the speed of a wave? The material in which it is traveling, okay? Now, um, 
Yeah, we'll, we'll go with this screen. So in terms of waves and, and, and sort of the, the toolbox for waves, okay, um, I mean, everything from simple harmonic motion applies, but very few of the equations kind of carry over. Now, omega is going to appear at some point, okay, here in just a second. So there, the relationship between angular frequency and linear frequency still stay the same. That, that, that doesn't change. But we have this new, call it a wave equation if you want. It's not the wave equation, it's just a wave equation. Um, and the mathematical description for a wave, don't panic. Looks like that. It can also have a sine function in it. Don't, don't worry about the sine or cosine function. It's got a wiggle in it, okay? Matter of fact, a lot of books tend to just default to sine. That's okay. What do you think A means? Amplitude. It's amplitude, right? So if you see a mathematical description of a wave, the number sitting in front of the cosine or sine is the amplitude, okay? Is that x1 or? It's kx minus omega t. Oh, on the, on the y. Oh, it's x comma t. Okay. Um, oh. Physicists get really picky about the function here depends both. In other words, the variables in here are both space and time. So, a linear and a time. Would y in the parentheses go to coordinates? There's no y there. It's oh, no, no. kx, y, x. Oh, oh yeah, y. It's called uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. So when we draw a wave, here, here's the problem, right? So if I if I draw this wave like this, okay, then this is the y-axis, <laughs> this is the x-axis. Where's the t-axis? <laughs> it's time, right? Again, whenever we draw something like that, it's a freeze frame. What is this wave doing in time? What did the animation just show us? It was moving, wasn't it? And I can't show that on a piece of paper like this, right? I can show it in an animation on the computer, but it's really hard to do on a piece of paper. And so the time axis isn't specified, but it is very important because this wave moves places. I want you to be able to look at that function and tell me like what the amplitude of a wave is, okay? And what the angular frequency of the wave. Where is the angular frequency always going to be in this function? What's it paired with over there? Time, right? So if you see a function and it's a number with a t, well, you know the number in front of that t is omega. But remember, omega is equal to 2 pi n. And now we come to one of the more frustrating parts of physics. That k right there is not the spring constant k. One of the unfortunate things about the Latin alphabet is that we've run out of letters. There's only what, 26 to deal with in the Latin alphabet? Greek, I think, has one more or something like that, k. I think we should go to A like Chinese or something because they just basically have a near functional infinite amount of characters. But. We'll get there eventually, I suppose. This k is the wave number, defined as 2 pi over the wave length. And how do you know? Like, how do you know if k means spring constant or k means wave number? It all comes down to context. Look at the function. If the function has got x and t in it, that's a wave. When we did simple harmonic oscillators, I showed you the function for a simple harmonic oscillator was a sine or cosine omega t. You see how the x is missing in there? Okay. So this is like a two-dimensional function that evolves in time. This is a one-dimensional function that evolves in time. Right? But I want you to be able to look at that and go, okay, 
I know what my wave number is. It's the thing in front of X. And if I know my wave number, can, we, can I find my wavelength? Yeah, right? If I know my omega, can I find my frequency? Yes. In fact, if you put, if you solve, just a little tiny bit of derivation here. If you solve this for frequency, and you solve this one for wavelength, and then you put them together. It's lambda, which is 2 pi over k, times frequency, which is omega over 2 pi. What happens to 2 pi? It's that. So another way to write the, our wave equation up there is omega over k, where the k here is wave k, not spring constant. It's just called k. <laughs> it's called the wave number. It has units of inverse meters because it's 2 pi divided by lambda, and pi doesn't have units, so inverse meters there. But either way, you can get to it. And that function can just be read as a way of determining what's going on in a wave. So for example, right? Here I have a wave. Oh, oh, oh shoot, I forgot to tell you. Forget my head next if it wasn't attached. That minus sign in that function, the kx minus omega t, and again, I am not responsible for this, this is just how math works. That minus sign means that this wave's peaks are traveling in the positive x-axis. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't make the mathematical rules here. Okay? But the way cosine and sine functions work, if you take the difference between space and time, it moves to the right. Give you one guess as to what the sign would be if it was moving to the left. Okay? So it's the opposite of the sign. Okay? Negative sign means it's moving in the positive x-axis. Positive sign means that it's moving in the negative x direction. All right. So back to my example there. Okay, a wave is moving to the right. So instantly, I know what sign I'm gonna put in my function. What sign? Negative sign, okay. Has an amplitude of 0.6, a period, and a wavelength. Find the function that describes this wave. Well, the function is going to look like A, sine or cosine, I really don't care what you write. Physicists will get all uppity about which one, but it, for us it doesn't matter. Okay, so I want to write this function out. So they tell me the amplitude, don't they? 0.6, so I'm just going to do it 0 0.6, 0 0.6 right there, cosine, and now to fill out the rest of this function, I need to find the wave number and I need to find the angular frequency. Uh, what do you want to find first? Wave number, angular frequency. Wave number? K is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. Did they give me the wavelength? Sure did. 2 pi over 2 and a half meters. So let's see, I'm going to get a little bit clever here. 2 and a half is 5 halves, isn't it? So this is 4 pi over 5. So I'm just going to write that down. I didn't want to get my calculator out. So it's 4 pi over 5 times x. x is the variable, right? k is a number, and I found out what that number is. All right, minus, and now I do omega. Omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, but they didn't give me the frequency. They gave me the period. What's the relationship between frequency and period? They're inverses of each other, right? So frequency is going to be 1 over the period. The period was 1 and a half seconds, or 3 halves, which means the frequency is 2 thirds, which means that omega is equal to 2 pi times 2 thirds. So this is 4 pi over 3. So this is 4 pi over 3 times t. And now, oh, and you just write in SI units so that everybody knows that the amplitude's in meters. The wave number is in inverse meters, and the omega is in radians per second, so you don't have to go writing all the units inside that thing. And now, I have the mathematical description of the wave. We could plug and chug at this point. We could say, like, when the wave is half a meter to the right at time three minutes, right? You can just plug those numbers in, and away you go. Your calculator would have to be in radians mode. 
in order for that calculation to work correctly. We can flip this around. Given a function, what can you tell me about the wave? So this is like a lot of this like uh, Google Translate for waves, isn't it? Right? So they want us to find speed, wavelength, and frequency. So what's something you know right away just by looking at this function? The amplitude. The amplitude is 10 meters, isn't it? Great. Okay. What else do we know? Which way is this wave going? Yeah, this one's moving to the left, isn't it? Okay. Uh, we know the wave number. K is going to be 2 pi over 3. And we also know the angular frequency, don't we? It's pi over 6. Okay, what do they want to know? They want to know speed. How are we going to find the speed? We could use lambda f, but we could also use omega over k, right? Since we have omega and we have k, we might as well do it that way. So let's see, omega was pi over 6, all divided by 2 pi over 3. That's the same as pi over 6 times 3 over 2 pi. The pi is cancel. Um, the 3 and the 6 kind of not cancel, but do funny things. And I get 1 fourth. Uh, what? One, what are my units here? I've solved for a velocity using standard units, meters per second. So there's my wave speed. Uh, wavelength, How, where am I going to find the wavelength? Yeah, it's lambda, but what is lambda related to here? K or omega? K. K, because K is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So wavelength is going to be 2 pi divided by the wave number, which is 2 pi divided by 2 pi over 3, which means that the wavelength is 3 meters. Frequency? Well, omega is equal to 2 pi f, so f is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. Omega is pi over 6 divided by 2 pi. Pi's cancel, and I get 1 12th. So we can find information about the wave by knowing how to read its function. Not necessarily how to like, use the function, but be able to read the data out of the mathematical description for that way. This is just a beginning of the power that we have to understand waves and how they work. What we're going to do after spring break, when we come back together, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, is we're going to start applying our newfound knowledge of waves and wavelengths and frequencies to human hearing and how we actually process sound and figure out what sounds are like and how the clappy things on the side of our head actually work. Um, we're going to talk about uh, volume and amplitudes of waves, particularly as it relates to things like music and sounds that we hear. And then we'll talk about sonic booms and the Doppler effect. That's kind of where chapter 16's arc is going. And then we'll get into musical instruments and uh, other things in chapter 17. But again, that's all on the other side of spring break. If I don't see you at grass tomorrow, I'll have a fantastic spring break. Please be safe. Come back to me in one piece.